just wanted to go over a little bit of the data that's coming out of um, South Africa, the UK and Denmark, which I think are three of our best harbingers for uh, what's gonna be happening here, um, South Africa, obviously, because it was uh, the initial epicenter of Omicron, and we had the most time to be able to analyze the data coming out of there, although the data are not nearly as complete as they are coming out of the UK or Denmark. And UK and Denmark uh, are good to look at because of their um, very um, robust public health surveillance capacity uh, within Europe and uh, the large Omicron outbreaks that they're experiencing now. And both of these, I think, give us a good idea of what uh, potentially we can expect coming our way here over the next uh, few weeks. They probably have a, a week or two head start on us. So these are the, the latest data coming out of those three countries in terms of uh, cases per capita. So this is looking at overall uh, cases <clears throat> per million, uh, putting it into the more familiar context of cases per 100,000, just divide this by 10. So you can see that Denmark is uh, arriving at uh, astronomical numbers of 160 per 100,000 per day, which is uh, above where many of our states and localities have peaked. Uh, we'll talk about the fact that they probably have much better case ascertainment, so a more accurate picture of what their caseload is. So still, probably uh, fewer cases uh, per capita in real life than what we previously experienced. But it's obviously a pretty raging outbreak there in terms of case numbers. The UK is not far behind, and you can see both are still on an exponential growth curve uh, with Omicron. Interestingly, as you can see, South Africa um, has potentially peaked, certainly in Gauteng, the initial province uh, of, of the outbreak. Um, cases have been decreasing for the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, and that does seem to be a real phenomenon, although uh, difficult to interpret. We'll also talk about some of the problems in trying to overanalyze South African data here in a second. Um, and obviously just based on their cases per capita, you can see that either they are dramatically under ascertaining cases or their outbreak for some reason was much smaller. I think the former is uh, um, almost certainly the case and we'll discuss why. Um, if you look at percent positive, that gives you a good indication. So um, look at South Africa's percent positive uh, test number. So that's the number of uh, COVID-19 tests that are positive on any given day, uh, obviously. So they peaked at uh, about 35%, which is uh, above their previous high and, and also um, indicating that they've essentially saturated their testing capacity uh, well beyond that even, um, and that their ascertainment rate is really low. It, if you can remember, <clears throat> even uh, in Nebraska, certainly in Omaha and Lincoln, um, I don't think we ever got close to 35% uh, positive rate. In some of the rural uh, counties in, in Nebraska we have, and again, that's an indication that your testing capacity is far lower than it needs to be. Uh, in contrast, look at the UK and Denmark, even though they have huge outbreaks going on right now, obviously they've been able to ramp up their overall population testing to the point that they're still below 5% test positivity, which is really where you want to be. Uh, so that's a good indication that you're testing uh, at an adequate pace. So part of what we're seeing, I think, in South Africa potentially is related to test saturation uh, and uh, poor case ascertainment, uh, in addition to uh, several of the other things that we've talked about in terms of young people have been the primary drivers of transmission in South Africa. They tend to have more explosive growth in that compartment uh, and then potentially more precipitous decline after they've exhausted all of the susceptibles there. And it may take longer for um, transmission to occur through other compartments in the population and in other areas of South Africa that may have even uh, less uh, robust public health and testing capacity compared to uh, Gauteng, which remember is the, the home to both Johannesburg and the capital Pretoria. Uh, and so those are all caveats that we need to keep in mind. Um, there is 
Uh, additional good news out of South Africa, though, that seems to indicate that uh, at least so far, hospitalization rates um, potentially are also starting to uh, at least reduce the increase. Uh, so the slope of uh, increase in hospitalizations has uh, started to fall off. And the hospitalization rate seems to be disproportionate to the overall case count. This is um, and again, good accurate data out of South Africa has been difficult to get. So some, some of this is second and third hand data that comes off of Twitter feeds, uh, as this one does, as you can see on the left. But this has been a, uh, a graphic that's been floating around uh, Twitter, highlighting normalized data of cases, the top curve, hospitalizations, the middle curve pointed out by the red arrow, and then deaths for each of the four waves that South Africa experienced. And you can see for the previous three waves, for the most part, in this, um, uh, in, in this scenario, and, and this is all normalized to uh, the maximum. So that maximum was achieved during their uh, Delta wave uh, this past July. So you can see that, um, obviously, all of them hit the maximum of one because that's when it occurred. However, you can see that uh, all of those numbers tended to track one another relatively consistently over the previous three uh, epidemic waves. And for this current epidemic with Omicron, hospitalizations seem to be uh, about half of what you would potentially expect them to be at this given point of time. Now, this is again, taking the caveat that uh, we're still relatively early into their epidemic. We're a month in. Uh, growth rates have been uh, much higher than we've seen previously, and so hospitals may lag longer for that reason. And as we've mentioned, uh, cases have been primarily in younger populations, which we know um, will um, have lower hospitalization rates to begin with, um, and uh, we need to take all of those things into account. Never, uh, nevertheless, this does seem to be some uh, reassuring news potentially that uh, hospitalizations, uh, at least in some places with an Omicron wave, may not reach uh, what you would expect them to reach with uh, current cases. Uh, this is another graphic that's been floating around uh, analyzing in hospital mortality uh, from COVID-19, uh, comparing uh, the three major waves. Uh, so. Um, uh, disregarding uh, the first wave that occurred in early 2020. This looks at uh, their uh, uh, fall wave and um, then Delta wave and now Omicron. And you can see that <clears throat> um, in each of these waves, the in hospital mortality over the first 25 days of the epidemic wave uh, appears to be significantly lower. Um, again, we're early on. These data tend to lag and catch up, especially fatality data, since we're only a month in. So I, I expect that Omicron bar to go up, um, but it does seem to have a long way to go to catch up with the other two waves. So potentially, again, a little bit of good news. But I caveat that with all of the things we talked about. When you're looking at hospitalization data from the UK and Denmark, um, you see that continued trend where so far the numbers uh, in hospitalizations haven't seemed to dramatically rise and haven't caught up with the explosive growth in cases. Uh, again, with the caveat that hospitalization data uh, really out of the UK is a week behind, out of Denmark is a little farther behind, as you can see. Um, I think the 12th was the last day that Denmark has uh, reporting hospitalization data. So um, we need to wait and see, but at least we're not seeing a dramatic upswing in these uh, numbers as we might expect. Uh, but again, I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is these countries have much higher vaccination rates overall you know, for the population than we do. Uh, Denmark uh, approaching 80% fully vaccinated, uh, the UK approaching 70% and, and we're uh, only down back around 60%. <clears throat> and also keep in mind that both of these countries uh, have vaccination rates that predominantly are um, skewed towards the elderly and um, the most vulnerable. So uh, we have this data in a demographic breakout from Denmark, not from the UK, but the UK is similar in terms of proportion. So uh, almost 
everyone over the age of 60 in Denmark is vaccinated, right? You can see that that rate is well above 90, 95%. Uh, even for age 50 to 59, you can see that's above 90%. So in the UK and Denmark and much of Europe, there are populations that are most vulnerable, certainly over the age of 50 and, and very much over the age of 60 are essentially universally vaccinated. Uh, that is different from our population where we've spread that number out a bit more uh, in terms of we've been vaccinating now five to 12 year olds as well as the 12 uh, to 18 year olds for quite a while. And we have a significant proportion of that population vaccinated, uh, you know, somewhere around a quarter to uh, even a half in, in many areas. So a lot of our 60% overall vaccination rates are in younger people, which is great uh, potentially for reducing transmission events but doesn't do much um, you know, on the whole to reduce uh, hospitalizations and death. When you, know, you think about the, you know, the vast majority of those in a um, equal population uh, would occur in the elderly. So um, the bottom line is Denmark and the UK have better vaccination and protection rates for the most vulnerable, most likely to be in the hospital, uh, lower, vaccination rates in some of the younger ages that are where most of your cases are generated. And so uh, they're seeing large numbers of cases, but decoupling with hospitalizations, uh, whereas I, I'm not sure that that decoupling effect would, uh, would be the same here in, in the US. And actually, South Africa, despite a relatively low rate of vaccination, still, I think, below 30% overall in the country, um, uh, they've been adding more in the last several weeks their vaccination rate among their seniors is actually pretty high. I think two thirds now of South Africans over the age of 60 or 65 have received a vaccine. So uh, they're actually doing pretty well from that perspective, which again, may provide a bit of a blunting of that hospitalization data, at least early on. Um, last thing to talk about is uh, where we are currently in um, the US in relation to Omicron uh, proportion. And this is from CDC uh, that just came out uh, in the last day, projecting based on past data <clears throat> where they think Omicron uh, proportion of virus isolates is now. Uh, and you can see that at least based on this nowcast data, uh, and e even these data are several days old, um, and um, it's the source of some controversy among at least the Twitterati. Uh, CDC has estimated that about 73% of overall uh, COVID cases in the US are now due to Omicron. Hard to say in, in terms of are they, you know, are, are they off by 20, 25%? Is it really only 50%? Maybe, but the, the reality is if, if that's doubling every two days, uh, then it will make up that difference in the next two days anyway. And so essentially you can assume that by the end of this month, all COVID-19 cases in the US, and I would say, you know, probably including Nebraska, it's a safe assumption that uh, those cases will be Omicron now. Um, so that's where we are. Again, a lot of unknowns uh, and the, the overall severity and uh, epidemic um, characteristics of Omicron in the US, uh, still really unknown, uh, but those data may give us uh, a little bit of a clue uh, as to uh, what we can expect. Two uh, additional notes that I, I didn't put in the slides, but I, I think are worth noting just based on some of the information uh, I'm hearing uh, from multiple sources now. It's again, um, I think I mentioned this uh, in our last call, there does appear to be a significant drop off in the sensitivity of the Binax now antigen tests uh, in detecting, especially early in the course of infection, uh, Omicron uh, versus what uh, it had previously done for Delta and prior variants. As you know, I've never been a huge fan of that test uh, or any of the antigen tests, uh, especially in the face of asymptomatic uh, persons. But now there are multiple reports from lots of different sources, including uh, cluster uh, investigations in professional sports, in uh, Broadway, and in other venues where um, Binax now tests have been negative in the setting of very, very low CT values on PCR. So a low CT value means lots of virus. And so uh, this is a new phenomenon that appears to be occurring with Omicron, uh, but um, 
we have not yet seen publications um, to to validate all of these different reports, but it's coming from so many places now that I, I think that it's worth noting. The second thing is there's also, at least again, anecdotally, but from multiple sources, indications that patients with Omicron uh, appear to potentially have higher incidence of uh, urticarial reactions, hives, uh, and angioedema that look a lot like type one hypersensitivity reactions or uh, anaphylaxis or, or those types of allergies. So again, not enough data to draw definitive conclusions, but that may be a clue for people uh, if you are seeing those types of clinical syndromes, um, you may wanna consider doing uh, a COVID test uh, and, and potentially a couple of COVID tests to, to verify that it's not COVID because again, that seems to be something that we're seeing reported from a number of sources now. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions.